All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Jay Ligorio, and I'm going to give you kind of an AppSec talk today, uh, talking about how to find things on the internet that developers really shouldn't be putting on the internet. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit into who I am, just because I have to. They told me. Uh, what do I want and how do I get it? Where can I find that? Uh, how can I be the laziest as possible uh, while still achieving my goal? Uh, the results that I found, uh, what to do if I am unfortunately a victim of this terrible sin, uh, what I would do next, and, uh, and then I'll take questions. Um, so who am I? My name's Jay. Uh, I went to school in Maryland. Uh, I also got a master's at the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, it's a great place. Both are great places. Uh, learned a lot and had a lot of fun. Uh, I have various uh, cert uh, certifications here and there. Uh, hopefully that's not the most important thing to you because they shouldn't be. Uh, and I'm a developer, I'm an IT consultant. Uh, I'm also a private investigator licensed out of DC. Uh, I've done many, many projects both at, uh, at school as a student uh, for myself. I work for a Maryland-based ambulance company. I took them from a single tower server uh, sitting in a broom closet uh, to, a, to a data center type room uh, with air conditioning and five racks of, of systems. And I'm very proud of, uh, of how they've grown over the last 10 years. Uh, and I've worked in many sectors uh, and also for myself. So back in the day, uh, if anybody remembers the pocket PCs, right? Uh, PDAs that didn't really have internet connect, uh, connectivity, but there were these fold out keyboards. Uh, and for whatever reason, Microsoft never wired up the, uh, the keyboard shortcuts for Microsoft Word. So, uh, I built, a, I built an app uh, and distributed it on the internet and got a lot of play out of that, which was, uh, which was pretty encouraging. Um, back in the days before app stores, uh, last, I, last I checked before I took it offline, I got about a million downloads back when you really wanted to have an app uh, on, your, on your system. So that's, uh, that's kind of where I started and where Win32 kind of took hold of me from then on. Uh, also moved into .NET. Uh, unfortunately, I wrote a Facebook API wrapper for .NET back before they really had that. Uh, so sorry for everything that came after. Uh, <laughs> um, it was written up in a book without my, not, my prior knowledge. Uh, so even, even as of maybe last month or the month before, I would get uh, inquiries as to whether I was going to update that 10-year-old uh, that thing. And no, no, I am not. No, it's terrible. Uh, I also do a lot of software RE. Uh, if, uh, uh, if you've ever heard of the Night Scout Foundation, uh, they do a lot of help for people with certain disabilities. Uh, and, uh, and one thing that I, that I did for them and with their help was, uh, was try to make a, a piece of medical equipment accessible with, uh, just from Windows Store apps. And for whatever reason, the, the, uh, the equipment designer decided to do this terrible thing where you would, you would call from a Java applet through JNI to a C driver to, to talk to this thing. And who knows why they did it, but it was not that great. Turns out you could just do everything you need to do with an INF file. So, uh, so I went and read that with them. Uh, and yeah, just a just generally curious but law-abiding troublemaker. I'm not here trying to go to jail. Uh, so, so we're going to move on to what do I want. Now, as an OSINTer, I want to find cool stuff on the internet that probably shouldn't be on the internet. And because I'm feeling like a nice person today, I'm going to engage in responsible disclosure. So what's cool stuff that developers shouldn't be putting out there? That's private keys and crypto material. That's API keys and secrets, configuration files, and creds. Creds are, are huge in today's breaches. Uh, and open buckets with sensitive data. And I want to find my private data unexpectedly on the internet. Like, I want to call myself out on doing dumb stuff uh, that I might not realize that I'm doing. But trolling for data uh, randomly on the internet is labor intensive. The payoff is good, though. There's an, old, an umpteen million uh, number of credentials found in countless pastes. I'll talk about paste in a, in a little bit. Uh, the anti-public credential list in 2017 that was referred to from a paste. Verizon put a ton of, of, uh, a ton of uh, customer data on the internet in a bucket. Crom Tech Security Center found that. They also found FedEx, more customer data on the internet. Uh, Capital One, UpGuard, found a bucket, more, com uh, more customer data. GoDaddy, 2018, UpGuard found a bucket. And just last month, Pocket iNet, a little regional uh, ISP, wireless ISP on the west coast of the United States, they had data on the internet uh, in a bucket. And, uh, and we're going to go through some of that. Now, the pace are many, varied, and infinite, but buckets really do get you a ton of bang for your buck. They're a little hard to find, so we're going to go through some strategies on how you would find that stuff. Um, now, 
buckets, it, just having data on the internet doesn't sound that bad, right? So this is from Pocket, uh, Pocket iNet. It doesn't seem that bad, right? It, it's, a, it's a picture of some infrastructure that they have in a data center, and it, it sort of demonstrates a little lack of duty of care, right? It's very sloppy. It's not going to win you any awards on the Reddit cable porn sub, but, but it's, you know, it's there. It's not so bad. But this might be a little more sensitive. Now I have a logical diagram of infrastructure running in their network, and that's, that's not so bad. You know, it's not creds to those things. Wait a second. Maybe it might be. Um, now, maybe this is just random people in the business units that are salespeople. They don't have admin creds to anything, except when you go through it, yeah, that's a, it's a little sensitive. So buckets are really cool. They're everywhere. And that's just general data searching. Um, now, targeted red teaming, that's still also pretty labor intensive, and I'm still pretty lazy. And so you have to do subdomain searching. You have to do repo scraping. You have to find the API endpoints. And you have to have, find the actual confidential data uh, and you can do this manually using keywords, but again, you're doing it, you're doing it yourself. And again, I don't have time for that. So computers should be doing things that I don't want to do because I'm lazy. I don't want to manually search for all this cool stuff. I want it brought to me because I'm lazy. So what I need is this merciless automation. I need something to do it for me, again, because I'm lazy. And ideally, uh, I'd like to have a front end that lets me go through what it all found. Uh, even if it kind of sucks, it's better than nothing. Um, so where can I get all of this data? We talked about, uh, or I introduced Pastebin. Uh, it's very easy. It's a, uh, it's a text-based, uh, take, take your text, put it on this, uh, this site and hit submit, and there it is, just raw text. It's very easy for developers to go ahead and put that, that kind of thing out there, and they don't take steps for whatever reason to protect it, uh, to make it hidden really in any sort of way. I guess it's because they don't have a good collab tool. I, I mean, it's really not something that we can ever know, but people are just shoving sensitive code into Pastebin, and it shows up. Uh, API keys, salts, hard-coded creds, all kinds of stuff like that. And Pastebin even gives you uh, a map for a very easy place to hit for how to, in near real time, uh, scrape its site so that you can see things as they're going up. Uh, and it's also very cost effective. Uh, if it's not on sale, it's 50 bucks once for a lifetime subscription. If it is on sale, it's 30 bucks. So you can get into it pretty easily. And, uh, and it is not hard. They give you a REST API endpoint. You hit that thing. And it, uh, it gives you the data that you're looking for. Uh, now, we also have GitHub. You know, I, I want to look for developers making dumb mistakes, uh, so I'm going to go where they live, which is the social media of, so of source code repos. Uh, now, I'm a developer, and I do stupid stuff. I put it on, the, on the, uh, the internet all the time. Surely, there are other developers doing the same thing. I'm not unique. I'm not very special in any way, uh, way shape, or form. So you plug keywords into the, into the search box, uh, and you find those things that shouldn't be there. Uh, but again, that's very manual, that's very time consuming, and I don't want to do that. Uh, now, the one good thing GitHub gives us is it doubles as a, a platform for responsible disclosure. You can open a pull request, tell the developer, hey, there's something out here, you probably need to get rid of that, uh, and then they ignore you and they don't. Um, but we'll go through some examples where, uh, where we've tried that. Now, uh, uh, the other, for, uh, other source of data that I, I described was uh, was S3 buckets. There are other, other forms of buckets as well. Um, but buckets are giant treasure troves of data. Uh, Microsoft has, a, has an equivalent, so does DigitalOcean. Uh, and as we've seen in Pocket iNet, uh, there's lots of, of uh, useful data that probably shouldn't be on there. Uh, you can put nearly anything on there with near unlimited uh, file size, and it's really easy to access. You just hit an HTTPS endpoint uh, and a domain name. There are a few other forms to access buckets, uh, and we'll talk about that, but really this is just the simplest way. Now, finding these, uh, it takes some effort, so let's talk about strategies for that. Uh, there's a, a guy out in Virginia uh, who collects buckets uh, and, the, and the names of those so that other researchers can just go and hit those buckets and try to find flaws in them. Uh, he adds to the list periodically. Uh, not all buckets are publicly accessible now, uh, but really you do never know when permissions will change. In the Verizon wireless uh, disclosure that I mentioned, that bucket was originally private, uh, and there was an error made in the configuration later on that opened it up to everybody. 
Uh, and you can pull this list uh, that he has via REST API, uh, check things that you've already checked, you know, just make sure that things, are, things remain secure, uh, and when they don't, you know, ring a bell about it. And there are about 20,000 buckets in this list. Uh, now, that's, uh, that is someone's manual process. You know, that is his manual process. And we're all about getting rid of manual. Uh, so the other thing that we can look at is cert stream. Uh, when a certificate is issued by reputable uh, uh, certificate generators uh, or certificate authorities, they generate a certificate transparency log. Uh, and those go out into this cert stream in near real time. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that you can check. You can watch it for yourself to make sure nobody is creating certificates in, for your domains. Uh, so really useful for that. Uh, and now, since we talked about how bucket domain names follow a very well-known pattern, if you hook this stream, you can detect new buckets either as they're being created or when the, when the bucket is having its, its uh, TLS certificate renewed. Uh, and finally, it's, a, it's just a simple JSON web, scre web stream. It couldn't be easier to consume. Uh, and from their website, it looks like this. So it just flows, uh, flows certificate data in. Now, the other place you can find buckets is through your own DNS server logs, if you have the luxury of running your own DNS relay. Uh, you would be surprised at how many websites just pull data in from their own buckets just from the web browser. So if you run your own DNS relay, you can check some boxes uh, and, uh, and get those logs. You can, you can mine that for new buckets that you may not have known about. So where is this merciless automation that I talked about? Uh, so I, I wrote a tool. It's called Crawl. Uh, it is a Windows service. This is a Windows-centric talk. Sorry, guys. Uh, it crawls Pastebin and GitHub for everything that we've talked about. Uh, it divides workflows into different threads on different processors so that you can divide up the workflow uh, and really scale up and scale out as necessary. Uh, and it is backed by SQL Server for data storage and coordination uh, among many, many data processors. Or you can run it on one system and just have everything self-contained. So it saves posts from Pastebin and commits from GitHub when they contain keywords of interest. Now, the keyword thing is pretty useful because as you find more interesting keywords, you know, as time goes on, let's say I see a tweet like this and I think, oh, yeah, this uh, Facebook app ID kind of keyword there, that's pretty useful. I'm going to add it to my list. You can just throw things in there and it's going to go ahead and, and continue to search for new things. Uh, so it queues buckets for query, uh, things that are found in Protoxin, in cert, from CertStream in, in real time. Uh, and when you submit your DNS server logs, uh, it'll process those and look for buckets in that. And then it'll try and dump the bucket uh, and look for file names of interest. Uh, so something that's .pfx, I might find very interesting. Something that's .txt, maybe not as much. Uh, yeah, and it saves the, uh, the origin of this data so that you can figure out where it came from later on. So it's got a front end, uh, runs on IIS, of course. Uh, it lets you go through the indexing, it lets you do searching, uh, and it does presentation. Uh, you page through results to find things that are interesting. So the, the taking the, the wheat from the chaff, uh, you, can, you can really take this tool, run it overnight, and when, you come, and when you wake up in the morning and you come back to it, you're more likely than not to have something interesting in front of you, and really all you did was sleep at night. Uh, now, that said, the front end is more than a little rough. Uh, you've got, a, you've got a, a keyword search box and a table. Uh, it tells you where the, data, where the data came from, tells you what keyword triggered it to get collected, the time at which you got it. Uh, and as the download thread comes through, uh, it'll update the size after it actually downloads the, the material that, that it found in the search, uh, search stream. So you can run this on a single system, the SQL, uh, SQL engine, the website, uh, and the search services, as long as they're all pointed at each other, uh, even, if they are on a, even if they're not on a single system, it'll all just sort of work itself out. Uh, so you can have one system that only does pastebin, one or more systems that do GitHub or buckets and all that stuff. And as long as you point it all at each other, everything works out just great. The only thing that you really do have to scale up as you increase the amount of data that you have is your SQL Server. Uh, you can buy into bigger editions of SQL Server. Microsoft makes that really easy. So what results did we find? Uh, API keys for days. So in this example, uh, you have a Last.fm and a Discord API key. Uh, so it found these, and naturally, like, I, wanted, I wanted to go look at the repo that had this stuff in there and, and tell, the, uh, tell the, the code author that he should get that stuff out. But the files were gone when I went to go look. So how did the search engine 
actually find it, uh, the GitHub search engine? How did it display that uh, even though the files were deleted? And the reason is Git remembers everything. Even after you commit a deletion, the data is still in your repo, and a lot of people don't really realize that. So you can still, you can still find sensitive data even after all they did was delete the files and they didn't roll the creds or anything like that. Uh, I wanted to demonstrate on this one how, how quick it is to find certain things. Uh, if you notice, the commit time on this was 17 minutes ago. Uh, but it found the token uh, for the API key and, uh, or for the API that it was, uh, it was attached to. Um, so that's as pretty much as close to near real time as you can get. Uh, and seriously, if you want keys to a service, just go looking for it. it they're all out there. So what else have we found? Um, in Pastebin, uh, this person put some source code up there, and if you notice, it's got a client ID and a client secret, and that's fine. That's all you know, well and good. It also has a username and a password. This is for a Reddit, uh, Reddit bot. And for whatever reason, they just they put it out on Pastebin. They didn't protect it in any way. So, uh, so that got found, and that got disclosed. And no, they did not respond. Uh, now, we also have, uh, because we all test in production, of course, uh, these people had, uh, had a test site, many, many test sites. And their source code, their test harness, uh, had creds to all of the different test sites. Now, the likelihood that the test sites uh, were very different from the production sites from a credential management standpoint is near zero, of course. So, uh, so I ended up sending them a pull request. Uh, at the end of the week, I realized I hadn't heard anything back and thought I'd look through their other pull requests uh, and realized that there is a likelihood I'm never going to hear from these people ever again if something labeled soon is three years old. Uh, and now I mentioned Facebook at the beginning just because I have some dirty knowledge of how that, that works. Uh, this guy put a, a uh, Facebook access token in a paste, which looks, I mean, it does look like a lot of random data. Uh, it, you can't really visually pull much out, but if you know how the Facebook access tokens work, you know that it's tied to the identity of the person or the, or the entity that generated that token. So almost certainly related to this guy. Uh, now, I sent him a message, and to his credit, what I legit think happened is uh, when you don't have uh, any kind of tie or group membership in common to a person and you send them a message, you look like a spammer. So you go to this other inbox thing that Facebook has that no one ever checks, uh, and for what reason would they? So I think that's where it ended up. Uh, I think this guy probably never saw anything. Uh, and finally, you can use Pastebin to find buckets uh, by searching for those domain names. Now, I mentioned uh, at the beginning that buckets can be addressed by domain name directly. They can also be addressed uh, via, via, it looks like a directory. So if you look here where it says s3.amazonaws.com slash yoyo Zeus, yoyo Zeus is the name of the bucket. Uh, so you can find that stuff. And the, the false positives that I get a lot are M3U playlists for whatever reason in Pastebook, uh, Pastebin, and it's because the content to which they refer is in an Amazon bucket. And so I don't really know why that's, why that's uh, happening that way in particular, um, but it's something to look out for. Uh, so lots of private key material. Stop putting private key material on the internet. Oh, guys, there's a lot of it, uh, and it's super easy to find. Uh, and the other thing, the last thing that I'll talk about that I found was admin creds to a Taiwanese social network service. Uh, now, if you have a service like that and you need to verify users' identities through things like passports or driver's licenses, make a separate bucket for the sensitive stuff and the public things, you know, the social media type things, have that in a different bucket and make sure you manage your creds differently for each of them. Uh, because the one, if it gets dumped, who cares? It was social media stuff. And the other has your address in it. Uh, so we really need to watch the way that we're, we're protecting sensitive information. So what do we do uh, if I'm a developer and my stuff is out there and it's terrible now for me? Uh, so you need to be, from the beginning, really you need to be hypervigilant about what you put in your, in your, uh, your repo when you're developing something in public. Uh, it's kind of like learning in public, uh, nobody likes to do it, uh, but really you, you need to, if you're being visible about this, you need to watch what you're doing because it actually matters to your users. Uh, don't put API keys 
<clears throat> and cryptographic material in the project, put it in environment variables, things that are gonna be specific to the system on which your code is going to run. And as a bonus, now you can develop on test and differently on prod, uh, because again, real developers uh, test on prod and that's great, but we can be fake developers for once when it actually matters. Uh, and don't use Pastebin as group chat, uh, because even logging messages can contain sensitive information. Uh, so you really need to watch what you're, what you're just blindly throwing out and shoveling into Pastebin, because other people can find it with nearly no effort. So what if it's too late? Uh, on GitHub, this is gonna suck. Uh, I mentioned that, that Git repos, they save everything forever in the entire repository. There's no way to really easily get that stuff out. There's no one click. Uh, there is a lot of Git black magic that you're gonna have to do. It's gonna take a while, especially if your project is very complicated. Ideally, what you do is download your entire repo and all of its branches, nuke that thing from orbit, and fix it locally, and then commit it back up. That's your easiest scenario. Uh, now this guy, Steven Ostermiller, uh, I don't know much about him, uh, but he had easily the most accessible uh, tutorial about, oh my god, I've committed something to Git, how do I get it out? Uh, I would recommend that, uh, that particular uh, walkthrough for how to, how to unscrew yourself, really. Now buckets, Buckets, the story is, uh, it, it's a lot better for everybody. You don't have to do anything when you create your bucket to make it secure. There is a, a, a three section screen. The first section says, do not grant public read access to this bucket. Just don't do it. The setting on the same screen says, do not grant public read access to this bucket and says recommended, very helpful. And right under that, it says, we highly recommend you don't grant public read access to this bucket. Don't do it, just don't do it. It's very easy. Uh, now the one thing that I think Amazon did a disservice to developers for, if any of you are Windows admins, you know the role of authenticated users. That's anybody in your enterprise who can authenticate to the domain. It's not somebody in someone else's enterprise, they're your users. So you give them privileges, you know, the least amount of privileges that they need to do their job. In AWS, authenticated users is anybody in AWS. It's not anybody in your enterprise in AWS, it's anybody on AWS, and, <clears throat> and you can create AWS tokens for free. That means it's the same as public read access functionally. So again, I think this is what Amazon did as a disservice to its own developers. Yes, they call it out, but only in the help section. They don't make it super obvious in red flashing letters. Um, so really, if your permissions are already screwed, you can, as long as the horse is not already out of the barn, uh, you can change your permissions and it's very easy, but again, don't do authenticated read. It is functionally the same as public read access. Now again, I talked about separation of privilege uh, in terms of what you wanna have uh, for sensitive information in some buckets and public information in others. I know it's hard, I know it's difficult, and it requires thought and process, but really you can do it. Let's all do the right thing because I believe in you. Uh, and finally, what would I do next for this tool? Uh, I mentioned that there are several ways in which you can dump and address buckets. Uh, the, the first one is the, uh, is the fully qualified domain name, but there are several of those. This one only assumes that buckets are accessible in the US East region. Uh, I would expand that uh, to say all of, all of the rest of the AWS regions, of which there are many. Uh, now, on the back end, this thing can already store and delineate between uh, S3, Azure, and DigitalOcean storage but the crawlers for Azure and DigitalOcean storage aren't implemented, so I would implement those. And finally, uh, a front end that doesn't look like, uh, doesn't look like trash. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start the list of front end devs that are better than me, that's drunk toddlers, uh, and the file types uh, I would also increase so that right now what it does if you click a file is it'll display it as plain text, but if, for example, you clicked a .sir file, .cer, uh, it would interpret the certificate information and kind of show you things like the common name, the issuer, and things like that. I would do that for several uh, commonly uh, used but commonly used file types that should not be on the internet in the first place. 
Uh, I would also continue with integrations. Uh, I would add things like Trufflehog and Get All Secrets. Uh, again, this is a Windows tool, but with Windows Subsystem for Linux, uh, integration with stuff like that is getting a lot easier, and so I would do that. Uh, I'd also scan for entropy. Right now, if I were to, if I were to say, put raw certificate data in a file called mydata.txt, this tool would not find it. But if I then scan that file for entropy and notice that it's 99% you know, random, yeah, that's probably crypt cryptographic data. I would get that file. And finally, once it goes on the internet, which is probably in the next hour or two, uh, pull requests are open. Uh, yep, new features are, are welcome. So uh, I want to thank Pertoxin uh, and the CertStream guys for making a lot of the bucket detection possible, Upcard and Promtech for calling attention to this issue, uh, and uh, Stephen Ostermiller for his really awesome uh, how to get stuff off GitHub walkthrough. And finally, uh, I'll take questions, if there are any. I know I'm standing between you and lunch. <laughs> so, all right, thanks folks, I'll be outside.